Good morning. Before I get into the sermon, uh, we are now just full swing in life post VBS. And uh, so just a, a quick announcement as we head into the second half of the year. The small group study on boundaries has finished up. Steve did a excellent, uh, excellent job on that. And uh, if you had a chance to be a part of it, great. Now you have a chance for a lower quality teacher, um, but a different topic. So the topic for the second half of the year is tactics. And the, the goal is to learn to be able to speak and discuss your values with others. It is practical evangelism. And I'm, I'd like to illustrate what we're shooting for with a story. Uh, I woke up, as everybody else did, a couple of mornings ago, and the Supreme Court had overturned Roe versus Wade. State of Kentucky, abortion is now illegal. For me, that was a very good day. For some of my relatives, less so. Um, I don't know if you've checked social media, but there's some dumpster fires there right now. Uh, there are some very unhappy people, and some of them I am related to. One of them had posted something, and I wouldn't go into what they posted, but it was so bothersome to me. And so, I mean, this is somebody I've had Thanksgiving with, and what they were saying about me and my values, because I'm over here very happy, was so opposite of who I am that I really struggled. Because I did not want to add to the fire. I was not interested in some firestorm going off. And so what I did is I looked at what they had written. And I took some of the skills that are in this book. And I wrote them privately. And we had a positive conversation. Where we both left on a positive note. And without me asking, they removed the thing that they had posted. And I feel totally comfortable that if I have Thanksgiving with them next year, we will love each other. That's the goal with this. For you to be able to have conversations with people about why you believe what you do and have them not be different than the way you are used to talking to people. Some people are, are capable of that, uh, that conversation that's like a cold conversation. They just jump right in and says, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. You want to have Bible study? Some people are great that way. For the average person, I find that that's a bridge too far. That's, that's, and if that's what evangelism is, I'm not going to do it. The goal of this is to give you skills so that you can talk to your friends, your family, to strangers, and have a genuine conversation that lets your light shine. And maybe you don't get them all the way to baptism. But you know what? Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, and God gives the increase. If we can each have little conversations that nudge people in the direction of Jesus, that they might see him better, that's a win. That's the goal, to empower you to have discussions with people. Not confrontations, but discussions. If you're interested in that, please sign up in the back. The books are available there. First class will be July 17th. That's a Sunday, and it'll be at my house. Okay, with that, let's head in to the sermon. 1 Peter chapter 4 talks about the idea of show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Preachers like to define terms. I'm a preacher, like to define terms. Hospitality means literally love of strangers. So when we discuss the term hospitality this morning, what we're talking about is something that we're to show, which literally means to love strangers. It means to reach out and to do a loving thing, to act in a way towards people that you do not already have that relationship with. And without an expectation of reciprocity. 
Meaning, I'm not, I'm not doing it because I know you and I invite you over to my house and so I know you're going to invite me back to your house and, and we've, this is how it works. It, in fact, doesn't even mean to have people over to your home. You can be hospitable without having people over to your home. Now, hospitality, having people over to your home, is a form of hospitality. But it literally is just referring to the equality or disposition of receiving and treating guests and strangers in a warm, friendly, generous way. When we use terms for people, we say, if you're not their friend, it's just because they don't know you yet. That's a hospitable person. The opposite is, uh, there was somebody in our, uh, moved into our, our neighborhood, and they were not as sociable as one of our neighbors kind of liked, who is a very sociable person. And she used the term, she goes, yeah, people are just becoming more keeping to themselves around here now. You hear that term, they just keep to themselves? That's the opposite of hospitality. Meaning, I have my life, and you have your life, and, and we're not mean to each other. I'm not rude to you, and you're not rude to me, but you're over there, and I'm over here. And that, that works for me. Hospitality is the opposite of that. It is to see somebody who is a stranger and to love them anyways until hopefully they're not a stranger anymore at all. I will remind you and I will remind me, hospitality is a man. It is not a preference. It is not something we get to, well, maybe I'll work on that, but I have other things that I'm good at. There are some things where people have varied abilities, but hospitality is a character trait that is a requirement by God for all. We are told as Christians, as it was read in the scripture reading in Romans chapter 12, verse 13, to practice hospitality. Practice has the idea of repetition. It's not I did it once back in 1985. It is a behavior that is who I am all the time. In fact, you, you may even know some Christians who you once thought of as deeply hospitable people. They were involved and they cared and they were inv uh, and, and aware of other people and they were thoughtful. And then there came a point where maybe bitterness or heartache or trials and they just shut themselves off. And they said, not anymore. And so they ceased practice hospitality. You do not get points for what you once were if you are not that now. It is a requirement for elders. And you can imagine why that might be. If one is going to shepherd the flock, one of the, the natures of a local congregation is there are constantly new people coming in who the elders at that time do not know yet. They are strangers to them. Not to mention on a Sunday morning, we have guests that come and visit, and they, this may be their first Sunday here. And if you have an elder who goes, well, I just don't know what to do with strangers. You just don't know how to oversee them. It's a requirement. It's a character trait that we, we look at and we say, yes, if one is going to watch over the flock, they... They certainly need to be able to show a love for strangers. It was a requirement for the widow indeed in 1 Timothy chapter 5. The older woman who is now left alone, she has no children to care for her, she has no husband to care for her, and so her needs are to fall upon the church to care for her in a full-time capacity. The widow indeed had to meet certain qualifications for that though. And one of those was she had a history of showing hospitality. She was a woman who was known for caring about other people, befriending others, doing good for them, seeing them. And here's the last bit. It's required without grumbling. It has to be something that you have cheerfully chosen to embrace. Because to love strangers, we'll find that it sometimes 
you are inconvenienced. It is not as comfortable. This is why you see congregations where people kind of keep to themselves within the congregation. Everybody has their own little clique. Why? Why does that happen? Why does that happen in, in, in congregations? Why does it happen in neighborhoods? Because it's easier. Does this work? Good work? Let's work. And if you begin to love strangers, sometimes you find some of those strangers aren't as lovable as you might have liked. To interact with human beings is to interact with messy sinners. People who have different backgrounds than you, different vantage points and perspectives. People who are at different states of maturity, as well as at different stages of life. The day you're having a good day, they might be having a bad day. The day you're having a bad day, they might be having a good day. Boy, isn't that annoying. You're having a bad day and they're cheerful, uppy, yay. No, you don't want that. But look, that's that's. The nature of dealing with people is that when we reach out with hospitable heart, we're opening our lives to them with all of their differences. Hospitality is a term that is used uh, between the relationships between the saved and the lost, but it's also a terminology that is used sometimes to refer to the saved with the saved. Because we may be brethren in Christ, but that doesn't mean we're not still strangers to each other sometimes. Have you ever met a Christian who you didn't know five minutes before? They were a stranger to you. They may be your brother. You may be going to the same place, but you are strangers. And hospitality is the thing that bridges the gap. I will have you understand it's not a New Testament idea either. It's not like Jesus just showed up on the on the doorstep and in the first century and said, now we're going to start this hospitality thing. It is something that God has been having his people do from the very beginning. In Leviticus chapter 19, Leviticus 19, I know your favorite bedtime reading. In chapter 19, verse 33, it says, when a stranger sojourns with you in your land. This is speaking to the Israelites. When a stranger comes into your land, the promised land I've given to you, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you. And you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. There are two things in this verse I want you to see. One, this is a very good working definition of what hospitality looks like. Somebody is a stranger, they come into your territory, whatever that territory may be. It's your congregation and, and you're normal here and this is their first Sunday. Your home turf. You're at work, they come in, they're the new guy. Your home turf. You're sitting in the coffee shop first and then they walk in. It's your home turf because you were there first. It could be any number of different things, but when you are there and the stranger comes in, the definition of hospitality is you do him no wrong. First of all, you don't mistreat him. And the second is you love him as yourself and you treat him the same as if he were a native. The same as if he were your best buddy. The same as you would treat somebody else as if he were family. You treat him like family. That's the first thing I want you to see. This is a good working definition of hospitality. And then the second thing I want you to see is, it's interesting how the, the working definition of hospitality baked into it is you shall love him as yourself, which last time I checked is the second greatest commandment. This is why hospitality is so important. Because it is a working, active behavior of loving your neighbor as yourself. Reaching out and saying, I'm not going to keep to me and my small world. I'm going to reach out beyond that. Hebrews chapter 13, which talks about hospitality, says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. That's a New Testament verse in Hebrews 13, but when it says, 
for some have entertained angels unawares, that is in reference to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there were multiple occasions that you can read where somebody welcomed in somebody off the street into their home, and that person ended up being an angel. Something that is interesting about the passage in Hebrews 13 is it leaves it quite ambiguous as to whether or not that still happens. It says, other people in the past, when they entertain strangers, they entertain angels. You know that to be a fact. You can read of Abraham. You can read of Lot. But it also leaves this little bit of open-ended story of, might that be the case for us too? After all, when they entertained angels, they did not know it. It's not like angels went away. And they're not at work today. There is a blessing to be had with being hospitable. How many people would you be hospitable to entertain if you thought there might be a chance at some point one of those might just be an angel? Would you entertain 10 in hopes that one was? Would you entertain 100? Or a thousand to have that experience. Especially when you know you can get to the judgment day and God will say, I sent one to you. You entertained them. You loved them, though they were a stranger. Great opportunity to be found. The Old Testament teaches us the power of having hospitable hearts where we open the doors of our hearts and our homes and our lives to do good others. I will tell you, it's been a rough couple of weeks for my family. I am very thankful we have hospitals, but I would be very happy to not see one for a while. And people have been abundantly kind to us. It has made an immense difference and impact on me. And I will tell you, as somebody who's having his parents live with him right now, when they would come in and say, can we help with something? Do you need help getting dinner? And I go, no, I think we have dinner for about the next 16 months. They go, where? From the Christian. The answer, from the Christian. You've let your light shine. Thank you. God rewards hospitality. He rewards it. And as people of faith, that's what faith is. Hebrews defines faith as believing that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. God rewarding hospitality is something that we understand is a part of us seeking him by faith. The apostles were sent out empty-handed by Jesus. When Jesus sent them out two by two, he sent them out empty-handed. And he said, go to this city or go to that city. And if they accept you and if they welcome you into their homes, then what do you do there? You preach to them the gospel. And a city that was not hospitable, instead you walk out of that city, you knock the dust off your feet, you move on. The cities that had hospitable people heard about salvation. The cities that did not missed the message. They never even heard the message to deny it. They didn't even have the opportunity to hear the message and say, I want to believe it or I don't. Because when nobody welcomed the apostles in, dust off the feet, on to the next city. God has always rewarded hospitality. In Luke chapter 14, longer section here, it says, He also went on to say to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, otherwise they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, 
the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. We understand that when Jesus rebuked the Pharisees because they would stand on a street corner and pray publicly, so that everybody would see them pray. We understood that was wrong, and they ought to pray in their inner room, where only God could reward them for it, for seeing what they had done. And that when they fasted, and they walked around going, oh, I'm, I'm fasting. I want you all know, whew, rough, rough couple of hours. But that was the wrong approach. But here Jesus adds another aspect to it. When the only people that we ever invite into our lives, we invite out to dinner, we invite over our home as guests, we invite to do activities with us, are people that we are already tight with and we know it'll be reciprocal and they're already in our social circle and that's all. He says, you've already got your repayment. You've already, you've already decided what you want out of this. It's, it's social currency. You're going to do it, and then they invite you over, and, and you're going to uh, do this this time, and then they'll have some fun thing next time. And, of course, you're not going to get repaid by God for that. You got your payment. It was movie night at your house this week and waffle night at their house next week. But when you look around, and that's not your thought process at all, but if, say, after a Sunday service, you think you're going to go out and go out to lunch and you look around and you go, is there any visitor here that I could invite? Is there anybody I don't know yet? Or is there some hungry college student who's starving? I remember walking, this was back in Washington, and, and the, the University of Washington is right in Seattle, and I was stopped at a crosswalk one time. And there was a guy crossing the crosswalk, and he had a bag of Top Ramen, and he crunched it up. As he's walking across the street, he crunches it up, pulls out the flavor packet, rips it off, sticks that in his mouth, and then dumps the Top Ramen in. And I knew that was a college student. Like, is, is there somebody you could invite over? Stand alongside that would be simply showing hospitality. Imagine what would change in the dynamic of any congregation if that was the only thing it did. I'm not saying everything else changed, just one thing. If every congregation of the Lord's people said that every Sunday when we go out, we're not going to just go out with our usual crew. But we're going to make sure that somebody who goes with us is somebody we've not done that with before. What would happen? It would change the dynamic immediately. The congregation would become known as, you're so friendly. You're so nice. I felt seen. They opened their hearts to me. All they did was open a bag of Doritos. But it's amazing the impact. What does Jesus say? You will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Hospitality furthers Christ's work. It's kingdom work to be hospitable. It's evangelistic to be hospitable. It's edifying to be hospitable. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, the king will answer and say, And truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Jesus says on the judgment day, the separation of the sheep from the goats, he turns and he says, to the, If you did this and offering a cup of cold water or offering a meal, or offering a visitation to even the least of these, you did it to me. We have brethren that are shut in, and they cannot get out. 
you cannot even begin to fathom the amount of good you could do if you have 30 minutes. And take your kids, by the way. Older people, who are historically the most shut in, love kids. Take your kids and spend 30 minutes I'm telling you, you are furthering the work of the kingdom. In Romans chapter 16, verse 23, Gaius, host, and that word for host is xenos. It's the word we get xenophobia from, fear of strangers or foreigners. Host to me and the whole church greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you. And Quartus, the brother. Gaius was known as a host to strangers, a hospitable person. And it became his reputation. He was a host to me, that is to Paul, and to the whole church. The whole church knew Gaius as somebody that would give you the shirt off of his back and would come spend his time with you and would open his home to you. In 2 John, verse 5, it says, Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. Notice the language there. A stranger isn't always a lost person. You are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they, the brethren, are strangers. And they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God, for they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men, so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. One of the most pivotal times in your life is the transitional time when you move. When you move from one area of the country, from, your, from one hometown to another hometown, when you move out of your parents' house, or your family moves because of a job, and all of a sudden you're in a new area, it is a Pivotal transitional time for people. And we know this to be true for Christians. Because when you take a young Christian and they move to another part of the country for, say, college. Some of them, that becomes a pivotal time of growth. Some of them, that is the moment they fall away. I have had multiple times. Is it not just once? multiple times where a mother and father of an older child who's grown and out of the house, and sometimes that older child is married and they have kids. They come to services and their kid and their kid's spouse and their kid, their grandkids, they're all there. And they come up and they, they greet me and they say, we just wanted to meet you. We're so thankful our son attends here with his family. And I think, this is the first time I've seen your son. And you could see the kid with the look of, and this, these are grown men sometimes, like, don't tell on me. What happened is they moved, and that move became an opportunity for Satan to steal them away. Second John, when Christians' brethren are strangers and they move in, they need family here. It's our job. We either catch them or we drop them. It's our job in Christ's kingdom. Many a Christian has been lost because of a transitional time that Satan took advantage of. We can take advantage of those times too and do it for good. And lastly, it emulates the grace that we've been given. In Ephesians chapter 2, remember that word remember throws your mind back, doesn't it? Remember. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Do you remember what it feels like to be lonely? Do you remember that feeling? Remember that feeling when it felt like to be on the outside? And I will say, 
as I preach this sermon, some of you are thinking, I feel that right now. Some of you are thinking, I feel that right now. I feel lonely right now. Right now I feel on the outside. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm in the pew, but I, I feel like I'm on the outside. I don't, I don't feel embraced by the brethren. And if that's where you are, the rest of us, this is our promise to you. We're coming for you. We've let you down but we're not going to do it anymore. Can we commit to that as God's people? I'm not saying we're bad at hospitality. Remember, I already praised you. You got the carrot. Now's the stick. That's the way it works. It's preaching, right? I'm not saying we're bad at it, but there's room for better. There's room to do more. There's room to see more people. Can we as God's people... Can we commit to that? And I'll tell you also, if you feel lonely on the outside, there's nothing from stopping you from doing all the things I'm talking about. You don't just got to sit and wait. You don't have to be passive and wait for somebody else to love you. Love's a choice. There's nothing stopping you for, from at, right at the end of services, maybe you've just been kind of going home on your own there's nothing stopping you from being the person who says, hey, anybody want to go out? Want to get pizza? There's nothing stopping any of us from being the front line. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and of God's household. The hospitality of God is why all of us are here. Because we once were lost and now we're saved. We once were outcasts and now we are sons and daughters of light. Because God has a household and he said, come on in, this house can hold a few more. God already had a family. You realize that? I mean, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, that's a family. They already had a family. They didn't need you. They didn't need me. They weren't up there in the heavenly realm with the angels and the, and the heavenly hosts and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all in one in unity going, you know, if only we had Scott Beyer as a part of this, it would be great. They weren't saying that. They didn't need me or us, but their household let us in. It is the hospitality of God. It is why we are who we are. All he asks of us is that we too would practice and show that he has practiced in him. With that, the message is yours. We're going to have an invitation song. If you are not in the body of Christ, if you are outside, you don't have to be. Jesus has made a way. In fact, Jesus is the way, the life. If you, would, if you were ready to have a family, to be a part of the household of God, to have your sins washed away, Jesus has made a path. And the path is through the cross. Jesus died on the cross nailed our sins to the cross, was buried and came out of that tomb alive, never to die again. And he says, if you are baptized, you will be buried in that water with me. And when you come out of that water, the sins will be gone and washed away. You will never die. You will be mine. If you are ready to become a Christian, wait no longer. We stand and sing. Invitation song.